everybody. I'm Brian Kafka of the IPA, International Poker Association. I am a director out of Chicago, and I'm here with IPA Hall of Famer, Joy Miskelin. Brian, how are you doing today? I'm fantastic, fantastic. It's great, great to, to have you. you with us. Yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. Definitely my pleasure. Man, <laughs> I had to do a lot of homework on you. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Don't believe everything you read. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> All right, well, let's get started with, uh, with uh, just basic some basic questions. How many years have you been in the music business now? Actually, as a professional musician, it has been, let's see, Easter Sunday of 2000, no, Easter Sunday of this year, of this coming year, 2021, it will be, how many years with Yankovic? Let's see, I started when I was 13 with him. So I started with Roman Pacetti exactly, how many years would that be? Oh, could it be 60 years? Holy 60 hell. years. Yeah, I started with <laughs> Roman when I was 12 and made my first record when I was 12. And then the following year, I started with Yankovic. Yeah. Holy cow, that's a long time. It, it, it's hard to believe it's gone already. I yeah. mean, in a flash, you know? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So uh, as we were talking, I didn't know you grew up in Chicago. Chicago is my hometown. I loved it. I grew up in a little place close to Oak Lawn. Uh, it's now called Hickory Hills. I Hickory Hills, up, okay. Yeah, and 77th and and uh, and uh, Roberts Road was was the other street, and then uh, 95th Street. Yeah. And I went to school uh, actually in in Argo, Illinois, Summit. I went to yeah, Summit. Argo Summit. Yeah. And then I went to um, Dorn School, which was in uh, Hickory Hills, and and uh, then eventually we moved to. Actually, my mom moved while I was on the road one summer, <laughs> and I went to school in Berwyn for we lived in Berwyn for four years. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty cool. So you were at what age did you pick up accordion? I picked it up when I was four. I started taking lessons when I was five. Okay. So so it, it uh, and actually I played. From the time I was five and six and seven and eight and nine and ten, and then I decided the accordion wasn't cool, so I decided I wanted to play trumpet in, in school. And oh, I got okay. Play trumpet and thought that was very very cool. And then a year later, uh, my mother got a call. She worked at Corn Products in Argo. Yeah. And she got a call from the shop and said, "Listen, if your son still plays accordion, maybe he could come and play at our barbecue. You know." out in the in the groves like everyone used to do back then sure. and so i brought my accordion and i played i played all afternoon and i had all the fried all the barbecue chicken i wanted all the potato chips i wanted all the pop i wanted and at the end they gave me 12 dollars, and i said forget the trumpet this is what i want to do <laughs> <laughs> and that was the start of it all really wow that's pretty that's pretty awesome yeah <laughs> so how old were you when you had your first professional job was it was it 12 years old then with Roman, yeah, yeah. 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 The record we did was on Balkan, uh, the Balkan label, which was also in Berwyn. And uh, yeah. it's a long, long time. And Roman has passed away. I don't know if you know that or not. Roman has passed I away. I think I heard that, yes. He was 91 years old and a very sweet, sweet guy. Uh, just uh, was so kind to me. And, uh, you know, I mean, I was a kid for crying out loud. I was 12 years old, you know, 13 years old. It was just a, a wonderful way to get involved. And Roman was very, very popular in Chicago. He was probably yeah. the most popular Slovenian band in the city. And he had great jobs and uh, at, at fun places, a lot of picnics and festivals and groves and things like that. And it was just really, I was fortunate, very fortunate. Wow, that's pretty cool. Now, you had a long relationship about uh personal and professional with Frankie Yankovic. Oh, yeah. Frank How saw me you? play. Uh, I was 13 years old and he saw me play. Well, actually, I was still 12 and he saw me play. And uh, our friend who was also from Chicago, his name was Adolf Pazadik, was a banjo and guitar player. And uh, he introduced Frank to me and Frank said, why don't you go up and play with the band? And it was at one of John Carosa's places. I don't know if it was Club Irene, or if it was the Sherilyn Ballroom, but it was a place that John owned. And so I went up and played, and Frank just watched me, and uh, it was not long after that that uh, he hired me. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was That's a amazing. very exciting thing, you know. <laughs> yeah. That is amazing. Uh, how long did you perform with Frank then? Well, 
Frank picked me up at 13, and I was uh, the one that he wanted uh, at his funeral to cover him up in the casket and lower the, the lid, which I had never done or even thought about doing before, but that was his request. And uh, so that's how long it was. I was, let's see, when he died, it was 1998. So what was I? I uh, was 1999, would have been 50 years. So I was 40, 49 years old. Does that work? Yeah, I guess so. 49 or 49. Yeah, I think. Anyway, that long. And although I wasn't on the road the whole time, I left the road, but still continue to record with Frank and produce his records and things like that. Uh, all the way from Columbia to RCA to uh, MCI to all, all the all the major labels that he was on. Sure, sure. So would you consider him your poker hero when you first started? Yeah. Oh, sure. I mean, he was a big deal in my family because we were Slovenian. It was one of our own. And, and he had the TV shows and uh, uh, all over the country, a TV show in Buffalo, another one to, to, in Chicago. And he had to fly to these places and do these gigs. And when I started playing with him, I mean, just think about it. As a young kid, you know, playing Nevada, New York, California, everywhere, you know, everywhere in between. And it was a, sure. such a great experience because although I, I was really lucky to play polkas very well, uh, the, the pop stuff, I, I didn't know that much about it because I only took lessons for those few years. But Frank at that time had excellent musicians with him. I mean, they were professional musicians um, that had studied uh, the bass player had gone uh, to school and, and played with the Pittsburgh Symphony and guys like that. So I was able just to, to be a sponge and ask them all these questions and they would tell me the answers. And, you know, it was a, an amazing thing. Wow. wow, that's cool. Yeah. So uh, what inspired you initially to, to play polkas and to be a musician? Was there somebody in your family or you just... Yeah. My grandfather came from Slovenia and... Uh, and we had lots of 78 records and uh my uncle his his brother charlie gave me a record player and gave me his collection of 78s and of course at that time all it was was slovenian things being sung in slovenian you know and then i got some yankovic records that they bought for me and then frank was on television and it was uh you know i thought man i'd, I'd sure like to do that you know that would be a nice thing to do and so that, that was my inspiration. Wow, that's cool. Um, so I also see that you opened a lounge in Cleveland when you moved out there. Well, I moved to Cleveland in 1967. Yeah. And uh, I had already been with Frank for five years. And in 1968, I joined a Hawaiian group. A, it was called Hawaii International. And we played starting from L.A. to Hawaii to uh uh, next stop was Hong Kong, Japan, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, Okinawa, and then back to Hawaii and then back home. So it was almost a, a year's tour, and I was playing organ. And, uh, I, you know, I just wanted to spread my wings and see the world a little bit. I'd, I'd certainly seen the country with Frank, but uh, I decided I wanted to go. And I came back. In 1969, and uh, I turned 20 years old in Tonsonut Air Force Base. I tried to enlist in the Air Force. I got drafted like everybody my age did, you know, to go to Vietnam. And so I decided I didn't want to be a, 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 just join the Army or be drafted into the Army. So I decided I wanted to enlist in the Air Force. So it, it, as it turned out, I had had perforated eardrums and problems with my ears all my life since I was a little boy. Although my job as a producer, you know, I have to listen to mixes all the time and choose the one. But at that time, I did my Air Force test and they said, well, you can't go. You know, if something explodes near you, it's going to blow out your hearing. You're not going to hear any orders or anything. So at that point, unlike a lot of the people back in home here in the States, um, I decided that the servicemen that were there didn't want to be there anyway. So why don't I go there if I can and entertain them? And so we did. I joined a group called Hawaii International, as I said, and we were sanctioned by commercial entertainment, which was like an arm of not the USO, but of the military, of the army. And we went places USO wouldn't go. We played in camps all the way from the DMZ in the north, all the way to Vung Tau in the south. A lot of times there were no stages. They would build us a stage. We'd do the show. And it was really cool because we got to perform for soldiers that would never have a chance to see an American band. 
they saw uh, Vietnamese bands, they saw uh, Filipino bands, Australian bands and such, but the girls were Hawaiian. And of course they, they looked like they might be Asian, you know, Hawaiian, until they said their name. Hi, I'm Amy Lonnie from LA. And then the guys went crazy. And then uh, when it came to my time, I was the last one because that was that was really the clincher. Hey guys, I'm Joey from Chicago. And it was, yes, yes, you know. And then after each show, it was crazy because it felt so good. These guys would come up that had been there maybe in country for six months, eight months or longer. And they would say, man, you're from Chicago. Where are you from? And I would tell them and they'd say, you know, do you know my brother by any chance? You know, his name is, is Bob. Do you know? Uh, no, I don't. But if I ever run into him, I'll tell him you said hello. Oh, man, thanks, Joey. Thanks so much. You know, it was just a real moral boost to those guys. And it was very fulfilling. And um, the best year of my life, truly. It was incredible. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So then after after that stint, then did, is that when you opened your lounge? And played no, I came, back, I came back and played with Frank. And yep. then uh, that takes us to 68. Uh, and then I didn't open the lounge until 1978. Uh, 1978 okay. I hit 78 to 84. Gotcha. And it was, it was the last, really in, uh, in Cleveland for Slovenia music, it was like the last bastion. You know, I could see that things were changing, although everything is still going, but not like it was when I started with Frank. You know, with Frank, Geez, we used to go play Milwaukee and draw 2,000 people. You know, it was right. amazing back then. And then things started to change a little bit. So I opened the lounge and, and kept it for those six years. And it was great. I had uh, music. As a matter of fact, on one of my TV shows, Blazanche came uh, there and, and did a whole TV show for me uh, for nothing. We were we had been buddies since since chicago you know we both kind of grew up at the same time different music and stuff but eddie was he was an amazing guy i mean i would cut a record with some band that was completely slovenian and i get a phone call saying hey joey i love that waltz we're going to cut that waltz you know <laughs> it just was incredible and eddie was such a and tish his wife nice. so sweet and, and the boys now you know i look at tony and he's he's like his dad for crying out loud you know and yeah. and, and you're great, great, and the daughter, fantastic, fantastic people. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, by owning this lounge, you you managed to meet a lot of uh, interesting people, I guess you could say. It was, it, well, it, all it, the polka cool. people. You know, it was really great. Uh, I say a lot of people say, "What about your awards and this and that, and gold records and platinum records?" I think the best thing that ever happened to me was to make these guys that were my idols when I was little five and six and seven and eight year old they became my friends really good friends and i think that was the best thing that happened to me you know eddie habit kenny bass uh, um johnny vadnell johnny pecan all these guys were fantastic and, and pioneers for the slovenian music you know sure sure well what was your favorite polka that you ever written or recorded i i know I, there's there's no <laughs> I, I can't I can't even I can't even say the one song I wrote I want to call you sweethearts in the in the Hall of Fame uh, right. in, in Cleveland and that's probably been the most successful but yet the songs I wrote for Disney uh, like in cars I wrote one called uh, the Rusty's polka it's in cars you talk about sales that that thing sold millions you know but it, it may not be one of my favorite songs but it was one of the favorite things i ever wrote <laughs> financial you know? so yeah so well when did you run into you you uh but while you were in cleveland you became friends with steve popovich oh well even before that because steve had uh, moved to new york city you know how, uh -huh. how Steve's life went he his dad passed away they were in nemico in pennsylvania his mother his sister and steve and his mom decided that she wanted to get a, a little better life for herself, get out of the coal mining area and stuff. So she moved to Cleveland. And Steve, uh, being a, a just, he had the best work ethic of anybody I ever knew in my life. He would work 25 hours a day if there was an extra hour. Anyway, he wanted a job in the record business somehow. So when Frank had his broken back in 1963, Frank gets a call from Steve in the hospital. Frank was in a full body cast for months. And uh, phone rang and Frank, 
Yankovic, this is Steve Popovich. You don't know me, but I love your music. And my dad and my mother, we all love your music. And I'm in Cleveland now. I'm a young guy with my mother and my sister. And I want a job if you can find me any job at all in the record business. So Frank said, I'll call you back. And he called his friend Dominic, who uh, uh, ran the warehouse and got Steve a job working in the warehouse. I mean, putting records on shelves and everything like that. I mean, the very, very bottom entry level job. Yeah. <laughs> Steve rose to leave Cleveland. He went to New York City. He was the head of promotion and did it so well, better than it had ever been done before, that they created a position for Steve. He was vice president of promotion. Clive Davis created that position. And Steve, I mean, everything he touched turned to gold. Uh, yeah. When the, the Jacksons were signed by Columbia Records after they had left Motown, they couldn't call them the Jackson Five. They had to call them the Jacksons. They weren't selling many records on Columbia, believe it or not. And so Columbia was going to drop them. And Steve said, you better keep that young boy. That young boy is a star. And that was Michael Jackson. Right. Was Steve worked with Billy Joel. He worked with Bruce Springsteen. He, he, he broke the record of Boston. See, I mean, he would work on a record. It's not like it is now. Now... If somebody comes out with on a major label with a record, they work it for a couple of weeks, and if it doesn't hit, they just that's it. Steve worked, for example, Johnny Cash is a boy named Sue. He worked that record mm -hmm. for a solid year before it broke, going from radio station to radio station to radio station, plugging the record, you know. And, and it was a different world back then. It was a very oh exciting. yeah, I can and, imagine and, me. I'm, without technology, and, yeah. Oh yeah, you know, and and the cool thing was. I remember when I was with Frank because Frank was was pretty mainstream. And when I started with him, we'd go to record. We always, well, most most of the time recorded in Chicago at Columbia. And then we'd make the record. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, we'd hear the record on, on like WBBM, WCFL, something like that on a major station. And it was for me, I went, wow, I can't believe that's happening. Now that doesn't happen so much. But uh, thank God for guys. You know, like all of you, like, uh, uh, oh, Jesus, Keith Strauss, who has radio shows, now Eddie had his show, and everybody, you know, that still does it, we can still yeah. hear it. But it was real thrilling back then to hear it on, on you know, major networks. Uh, so anyway, Popovich and I, to make a long story short, Popovich became my son, Michael, who is now 36 years old. He's Michael's godfather. And wow. Steve's son, Steve Jr., is my grandson's godfather so we've always been very very tight you know and uh, steve uh, is great you know he's just a wonderful guy he never forgot the people that helped him on the way up mm -hmm. ever ever and if he was your friend he was as loyal as the day was long man he was he was incredible and without wow. steve there never been that frank wouldn't have won the polka grammy grammy that's that's for sure you know yeah so that's true so the, did he lead you to the connection with uh, Cowboy Jack Clements? He did. Uh, it was a Thanksgiving. I always made it a point, no matter where I was, to come to Cleveland uh, from wherever I was. At that time, actually, I was living in Cleveland still and play Tony Petkosik's Thanksgiving party, which uh, mm -hmm. still would go on. It didn't this year, but uh, hopefully it will next year. Tony's passed away since then, but the party still goes on. And it's on Thanksgiving Day. Now, fortunately, they're putting it the day after Thanksgiving, which makes more sense because all the people that used to have their kids with their mother and father, well, now they're the, the grandparents, so they have to watch the kids on Thanksgiving, right? But anyway, so I met Jack, and uh, Jack just, uh, I guess, like Frank, took a look at me and liked something, and uh, it was just a couple months later where Jack started flying me down to Nashville to do sessions. I had already done a lot of sessions with Steve, uh, studio work with, uh, like, Charlie Daniels and Doc Severinsen, and uh, Jack liked what he saw for some reason and started flying me down to Nashville. And I had already produced at that point, Frank's Frank, Steve and I uh, did Frank's Grammy record. And I told my wife, I said, you know, this is extremely good. It's, it's financially good. It's, it's yep. morally good. It's musically, it's, it's great working with some of the greatest musicians in the world. And he, I said, Jack wants me to stay down here if we could move here. I said, but I think instead of just jumping the gun, why don't you stay up in Cleveland in our house? I'll buy another house in Nashville and keep it for a year. And if it works out, great. Move here with the kids. And uh, the year went by real quick. And it was 
just better than I ever thought it would be. It was incredible. You know, that first year I worked with Johnny Cash and Waylon Jennings and, and the Everly Brothers and Emmy Lou Harris and uh, geez, on and on and on. John Hartford, Glenn Campbell. It was incredible. It was an incredibly great experience. And uh, so anyway, we moved down there and stayed there from 1987 to uh, 2017, 30 years. And it was wonderful. Oh, that's wonderful. awesome. Yeah. yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I was just, I was just doing a look, like I said, a little bit of reading. So you also recorded with uh, Shania Twain as well. Mm -hmm. And her come on over recording. That was a big one. Yeah. So a friend of mine, you may have heard of his name. He's passed away too. His name was Gaylord Klanick. He lived in Detroit. He had a great band in Detroit. Wonderful guy. One of my best friends. And so as a joke, I came up from Nashville and in my kitchen, when we still had the two houses, I came to visit my wife and my kids. And uh, there was an accordion. And I said, where did that come from? And my wife said, well, Gaylord said, he wants you to have that. So, okay, so I didn't even pay attention to it. I took it down to Nashville. I took it out of the case and it was leaking air. It was doing <laughs> everything. Like I'd never played that ever in my life on a job. Right. So as a joke, I forget who the session was that, that where I used it the first time. It might've been a Johnny Cash session. And I put it on and for sound check before we rolled tape at that time, I played it and, and Cowboy Jack said, what is that accordion? And I said, Cowboy, it's a joke. I said, I, you know, half of the thing doesn't work. And he said, but I love that. So, problem with accordions in records, in country records, pop records or anything is that an accordion is a funny instrument. If you make it, uh, a little bit hotter in the mix, it's too loud. If you make it a little bit down in the mix, you can't hear it. Right. This accordion, this accordion had a, a wonderful chorusy sound that you could put it right into the mix and you could still hear it, but it was not too much. It wasn't too little. So right. anyway, I got the, I sent it away and I got the accordion completely fixed up. So that little crappy accordion that was going to be thrown away on Shania's record, we get in there and Mutt Lang, of course, she was. He was married to Shania at that time. And my yep. good friend, one of the greatest piano players in, in Nashville, his name is John Hobbs. And we did this song, Come On Over, you know. And so I used that accordion and it just worked. That little accordion, the, the first year that record sold, it sold 29 million copies. So that <laughs> little accordion was heard maybe more than, oh, for sure, more than any other instrument I had, you know, counting the radio and everything else. It just, it was funny. Gaylord used to love that story. It's just fantastic. And I use it on Garth's record too. I use it on yep. John Cash's and stuff. And, and it, I rarely would ever, I would never play it in person because I would be afraid I'd pull it and it would come apart. But it just had that <laughs> magic. When you put it through a microphone, the right microphone, it just, it was beautiful. It just worked. Very lucky. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Did you ever think you'd have a career like you had? You know, yeah. No, well, that's all these. I'll tell you, Brian, I never, ever, ever, ever doubted that I would make music my life. And as you can imagine, a young kid, like as I was, you know, teenager and stuff, and how many people said, you've got to do this. You've got to do this to have a backup plan. You know, you should work and just play on the weekends. You should do this and don't do that. I never doubted it. I, but here's my rule. It takes this much talent, that much determination. And the screen's not big enough to show how much luck it takes. That's the luck. Without <laughs> yeah. the luck, it doesn't matter. I mean, I know guys that are brilliant musicians, and they've never been in the right place at the right time, and it just doesn't work. I fortunately, I think people say, well, Joey, you had a gift. I think my gift was whenever a door opened, I wasn't afraid to walk through that door. I, I wasn't, you know, even, even when I moved to Nashville, I always would make sure I had a backup plan. Patty, you stay up here. If it doesn't work, I'll sell the house and come back up, you know, but I went and fortunately she was always had my back. My wife always had my back, no matter what I wanted to do, what I wanted to try. It was go ahead, whether it was the, the lounge, moving to Nashville, be, going on the road with riders in the sky, anything, you know, yeah. so it was really, really great. How many years did you play with riders in the sky? I'm still with them. Oh, you're still, still with them? With, okay. I started with them in 1988. So what is that? That's 32 years, almost 33 years. Holy yeah. cow. That's Although a long we, time with one band. <laughs> I haven't played at all with them this year because of all these surgeries. Yeah. And, you sure. know, and, 
and they're playing very, very few dates. They played in the Shipshawana, Indiana, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, this a week from Saturday, they'll be playing in uh, uh, Loretta, uh, Tennessee. So not very many things. And the Opry now is starting to come back, thank God. Yep. Because for a while, uh, they wouldn't allow any people in the house. Now they're allowing 500 people in. And uh, so riders are going to play there two times, but I'm still not going down because of my back surgery now. So it's one thing after another. But I'll be uh, the new guy. They, the nurse said, you'll be the mil $6 million man. And I said, no, I'll be the $6 man because that's all the money I got left after all these surgeries. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about the, you were in a movie as well. Uh, you two yeah. and other people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's another funny story. So I'm in my studio in Nashville and Cowboy knocks on the back door and to the studio and I open it up and he says, look, he said, I just got a call from Bono from U2 and he wants you to arrange the, the horns and play B3. And I said, oh, I, I'm happy to play B3. I never heard of U2. I didn't know who they were. I'd never heard one, <laughs> not, you know, nothing. It's not like the Beatles, you know, where it changed sure. my life. And stuff. But uh, I said, well, Jack, Okay, I'll do it. I'll arrange the horns and stuff. You're going to use the Memphis horns. And I said, give me a couple of records so I can hear what the horns do. You know, well, they never used horns until that record. So I put the record. I said, Cowboy, there's no horns with this band at all. He said, just arrange the horns the way you want to do it. Okay. So I did. We go to Memphis, right to Sun Studios, where Elvis recorded and Cash and Roy Orbison and everybody, yeah. you know, because Cowboy worked there. Cowboy was the one who wrote a ballad of a teenage queen for Johnny Cash, uh, uh, so many songs for John and, and produced them back then. So I had written out the horn parts and it was really thrilling to be with these guys. I mean, they were just regular guys. They were guys from, from Ireland and uh, the Edge, the guitar player said, you know, there have been a lot of people that wrote their theses about how we delved into the ancient Celtic music and how we did this and, and research. He said, the fact is, we just play what we can play, and it works. I said, that's fantastic. So the day comes, and we go into the studio, warm up everything. I put the music out for the Memphis horn players, and we're going to do Angel of Harlem. So it starts out with this glist on the organ, you know, bow, wah, and the horns come in, bow, bow. Those guys that were so used to just having uh, a piano player writing out their parts, Mm -hmm. in concert C that and I had already transposed their part so they were transposing my transposition already <laughs> you know you know it's like so the so the trumpet player if I wrote a B flat which was the proper note for him he'd be playing an A flat because you know and it was horrible when they hit that first pop I turned around and looked at Bono and I wanted to crawl underneath the organ bin <laughs> and, and so he stops and says to me Joey, is there a problem? I went, I don't think so, but I'm going to find out. And I told the guy, I said, what'd you do? I said, did you already transpose it? Yeah, I did. Okay, then it was great. And then the whole whole session went went fine. It was just fantastic. Really, really great. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. So tell us about uh, any other movies you were involved in. You mentioned Cars and Mulan. What else, what else, what else were you involved not in? Mulan, not Mulan. No, not oh, Mulan. I thought you mentioned Mulan. No, it was called uh, The Wild. Uh, here's what oh. I did. We did the short subject as writers. It won an Academy Award. The short subject that appeared before Monsters, Inc. And we did the, the music for it. I produced it. We played the music. It's about the birds on a telephone wire. And the big bird comes up and they're pecking at us. You know, it won an Academy Award. It's really a oh, cool well. thing. <laughs> yeah. And then we were in, uh, we were in uh, Toy Story 2. We sang Woody's Roundup when okay. one of the little animals goes and the tv goes on it's woody's 1950 cowboy show that's us singing yeah. you know and uh, so then we made an album disney said will you make an album of the characters and situation write your your own song so we each wrote songs and stuff and came out with the album on disney called uh woody's roundup featuring riders in the sky it won our first grammy so we did that and then then the bird thing came next and then uh i produced on my own a thing that happened in front of the Incredibles, it's called Bounden. It's about a sheep that gets sheared and it's really egotistical sheep. And then it gets sheared and he's kind of, you know, because he doesn't have any clothes on. So now, right. you know, he's stepped down a pig and then cars and uh, 
a lot of good stuff for Disney. I, I was in China two years ago. Um, I wrote some songs for Disney Shanghai, Disneyland Shanghai. Okay. And so I recorded all the tracks in uh, playing accordion. There's accordion and all this stuff. I've never forgotten my accordion, right? So in Nashville, they wanted me to write 10 songs and I wrote the songs and then uh, had English lyrics and the, the singers sang in English and then took the tracks and sent everything to China so they could translate the lyrics into Mandarin. And right. then I went then I went to Shanghai for a week into the recording sessions there. So yeah, Jesse the Odal and Kyle Girl in America, and there she was, <laughs> you know. And it, it was fantastic. It was it was incredible. It was fun. And Disney's been so kind and so nice and uh, just lots and lots of fun. That's awesome. Let's go back to the poker field. Uh, what do you think mm -hmm. set you apart? Oh, I don't know. I just played. I don't think. I, I, you know what? A lot of guys, especially Slovenian accordion players, I, I, I must say, I, I've never run into this with, with Polish players because they're all so nice. But Slovenian players can have egos. And everybody seemed to be in a contest. And I never gave a damn about that. I just did what I do. And and I did it because I loved it. I was never trying to beat out him or beat out him or anybody else. But I was fortunate to be in a, in a situation where I didn't have to try to do that, too. You know, yeah. and, uh, I think with Frank and I, a lot of these players that bought the records back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, they say that it was just a real good combination of the two of us. We sort of felt our music together. And back then, Frank was still playing pretty good. He uh he was never a great accordion player, but he was a hell of a stylist. You know, just like you can't say Jimmy Durante was a great singer, but he was a stylist. Louis Armstrong was not a great singer, but he was a stylist. You know, you've got Sinatra on one hand and, and Dean Martin and Tony Bennett. On the other hand, you've got guys that were, you know, recognizable because of their style. That was Frank. And you could always count on Frank to play the same song the same way every time. And it, uh, as I say, when I started with him, the musicians that he chose were absolutely tops. They were fantastic. And it was so good for me to be in a band with guys that musically just eclipsed me. And I could learn from every one of them. You know, uh, yeah. I always tell my kids, my kid Johnny is in a band. He plays guitar. And I said, Johnny, whenever you, you pick a band, pick a band where you're not the best guy in the band. Because then you can't learn anything, you know. Until you really later on in your life, you can real you realize as I do that you can learn something from a guy in the corner playing the accordion. Maybe it's something you don't want to do, but you'll learn something, you know. And it, it changes your attitude. But I was very, very fortunate. Not for Frank so much, although Frank taught me stage presence, how to have stage presence, and, and exude charisma and things like that. But uh, and what the heck, you know? I was recording at Columbia Records playing. Vegas, Tahoe, Rio, and Alco when I was 13 years old, you know, and, and uh, I had probably more fun than I should have, but I'm still here, so that counts, I guess. Wow. So, all, all the years on the road. Yeah. Tell us one of your funniest stories that's ever happened to you. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Let me think of one I can tell. Uh, all right. I'll, <laughs> yeah, gotta... I'll tell you a great story, and I, I feel guilty, but don't forget, I was a teenager. There was a fellow in the band, I'm not going to mention his name, and he had a mandolin. And he didn't play mandolin on stage, but he always had the mandolin in his hand. He was always plunking it all the time, all the time, all the time, oh, trying to go to sleep, you know. So we were in Canada, and he wanted to back the Yankovic bus up, which was a 1937 white. I mean, if you saw that thing coming, you you knew it was some kind of strange vehicle anyway so he, he had put his mandolin on in the back on the ground in back of the bus oh, no and uh, so he, he rolls down the window and he says hey any cars or trucks behind me and i went no <laughs> and he rolled right over his mandolin uh, and I, I feel bad today but it was so peaceful after that <laughs> it was just so nice and quiet and then, yeah yeah that's cool. Yeah, those are those are the best ones. They were great days. Just fun, you know, just to having a blast. Yep. So what do you what do you say would be your greatest achievement? 
You know what I think my greatest achievement is, honest to God, uh, people have asked me before, and I say, I think my greatest achievement of all are the friends that I made. Uh, it's the music. Music comes and goes. Whatever I've done will still be available in some form 100 years from now. If anybody wants to listen to it, they'll be able to. If they don't, it's still there. But friendships and, and people I've met over the years, you know, out of tens of thousands, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, the friends that I have, you can still just put in your arms. I mean, that's it. You, there's a lot of people that you meet that you're acquainted with. But as far as close friends, it's it's good. And people in, in the music business, uh, I remember how lucky I was when we were playing, for example, in the Nevada circuit. We were playing in Lake Tahoe. We would play 45 minutes. There was a 15-minute break to change bands. Then the other band would come on. Then the same thing, 15 minutes in the other band. And we were doubling with people like uh, Trillos Panchos, uh, Red Norval, Louis Jordan, Homer and Jethro, Sam Buter and the witnesses. I mean, all these people were there at that time. I remember Roger Bright, who was a great friend of mine. Eddie B knew Roger very well, too. Roger was my best buddy uh, forever, 35 years until he passed. And we, in 1964, I think it was, we went, I was 15. So I could go in as long as I had an adult with me and didn't go on the floor. I could go into the lounge and have a Coke. And it was after we had played. So it was maybe 11 o'clock at night and it was at uh, the flamingo and we walked into the flamingo and walked into the lounge and sat down buddy rich was playing drums and had already been playing a solo the waitress came over to us i ordered a coke and roger ordered a beer still playing a solo she walks over to another table takes an order he's still going and then another table and finally goes to the bar gets our drinks takes him to that table, takes the other one to that table and comes back to us and he's still playing his solo. So the band that he was playing with there was Harry James and his big band. It was a full big band, like on an, an L-shaped bandstand where, where yeah. six guys were here, maybe eight of the guys were there. I mean, I have chills thinking about it. Now, that's the kind of stuff wow. we used to get in the lounges. That was the lounge. That was not the big show. That was the lounge. Don Rickles was in the lounge. I mean... <laughs> great great people people that, that were in the lounges then most were better than the ones that are in the lounges now in the big rooms now you know oh, yeah. they were oh, yeah. fantastic fantastic awesome. field music oh the best and so i of course as a kid i always kept my ears open and i would sit there and listen and pick up things you know and then try them out that night in my hotel room we would go to vegas for three weeks we'd go to lake tahoe for two weeks we'd go to uh reno for two or three weeks so once we hit the nevada area we were there for almost all summer you know then yeah. i go back to school which was a real drag for me after sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great learning experience man i always say that i didn't go to college i, I only graduated high school because my mother wanted me to I, I knew what i wanted to do and uh and i wouldn't have although i'm glad for her sake that i did but uh the education i got on the road it was like going to college and getting paid for it. You know, I got paid every single night and I would learn things musically. You know, I'd go listen to some guy and I would try it out. Plus, I couldn't gamble in those years. I was too little. So I would go in. The, they had a practice room by the by the dressing rooms. And I'd practice, you know, all night long when we weren't playing. You know, we play 45 minutes. I'd come down there, practice for 45 minutes till it was our turn again. It was a just couldn't have been better. It was perfect. It was just perfect. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> it was great. So do you have any, any advice for any new musicians coming up in the polka field? What, yeah. What, what can you give them? Just remember, no matter what anybody tells you, polka music is great music. It's great music. It's our heritage, whether it's Slovak or Polish or Slovenian or Croatian or whatever it is, German, it's our heritage. But the key to it is always play it the best you can. Don't let people, when they come and tell you how good you are, don't listen to them. Say, thank you very much. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people I know that were started out so great and got to be 15 and 16 years old. And people are told, them, hey, you're really great. You know, you're really great. You're this and that. And they would stop learning. They would just stop. And then they never got any better. I remember a guy told me one time, he said, you know, back when you were drinking, you really played great. And I said, that's because you were drinking, too. <laughs> and you thought I did, right? So just you play for yourself 
as far as teaching, look at your crowd, play what the crowd wants you to play. And remember, without that crowd, you might at some point get upset with somebody, but those people are paying your bills without them. You're done. You're going to sit at home and play by yourself. You know, it's, uh, just do it and and never really never be afraid to take a chance musically. You know, I look at this, the young kid, Eric Nolkamper, who played with Eddie, you know, and I remember how some of the Slovenian people up here, musicians said, oh, Eric's playing with a Polish band. And man, I remember I walked into a conversation. I said, not only a Polish band, my friend, it's the number one Polish band. And Eddie's my friend and number two. Don't you wish you were working for and playing music for a living like Eric is? And then everybody yeah. shut up finally, you know, mm -hmm. don't ever be embarrassed, man. Never, never, never. Well, Joey, thank you so much again for this opportunity. I mean, it's, we could talk for probably another hour. <laughs> I'll tell you where we're going to meet one of these days. When I come into town, once this crap is all over, there's my favorite pizza joint. And uh, uh, it's on 122nd and Harlem Avenue in Palos Hills. And it's called Joe's Italian Villa. Okay. It used to be on 87th and Harlem. I remember when the dad was living. Now there's only one son that's still alive. We'll go there. I'll buy you the, the best pizza you ever had in your life. I go awesome. there and I I call them up and they say, I want 20 frozen pizzas. And I'll make 20 and I'll take them back home here. I used to take them <laughs> and then now I take them to Ohio. We'll go there, there and buy go. the biggest pizza you ever had in your life and the best. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to that. But ladies it. and gentlemen, once again, I'm here with Joey Miskelin. And um, thank you so much. Thank you. Let me say thank one thing about you. John, um, I'm relay with with you. Thank you. And and since you're in Chicago, I've got to say this. I thank all the people in Chicago that put up with me when I was a young boy trying to play and they always patted me on the back and were so nice to me. And and when I say don't listen to the crowd, I don't mean that. I mean when somebody's giving you an honest to gosh, like I really enjoy what you're doing, that's different from saying, Man, you're the best, you know. And I appreciate all those people that watched. Most of them are gone now, but uh, they were fantastic. Gave me a place to play, a place to learn. And I love Chicago. It's still my favorite city. You know, uh, the Chicago that I knew when I grew up. Sure. I yeah. hear you. I hear yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much again, Joey. Thank you, Brian. Thank you very, very much. Take care. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Oh,